This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. What is Chalkboard Chat? It's an MPB education podcast. It's a variety show providing information and resources for teachers, students, parents, guardians, and everyday people on various topics. It's learning something new with every publication. Chalkboard Chat. Find the podcast or listen from chalkboardchat.mpbonline.org. From MPB Thinks Radio, this is Now You're Talking. It's a show about the most interesting people and stories of Mississippi. I'm your host. I'm Marshall Ramsey. And I'm editor-at-large and cartoonist with Mississippi Today. You know, absolute passion for nature. And, of course, a recent presidential appointment to the North American Wetlands Conservation Council and the Neurotropical Migratory Bird Cons- Conserv- Conservation Act Advisory Group. Say all that twice fast. Uh, it's, you ought to see his business card. Anyway, Alex Littlejohn is in the house today to talk a little bit about his love for the outdoors, and it's clearly reflected uh, just as a in the fabric of his life. And with a degree from Mississippi State University and experience working as an intern for the Corps of Engineers, the state director of the Nat- Nature Conservancy of Mississippi is here to discuss nature, his presidential appointment, and his early life as uh, growing up in the Oxford area. Of course, Alex, welcome to the show. It's good to have you on. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm excited to be here. And, uh, you know, you don't hear too many bulldogs that are from rebel country i'm about to say I, I think that's probably the first thing are you getting help for that because i know that's got to be a confliction i tell you you know i i used to I used to joke that for the for the first few years i was in startville they hated me in oxford because i went to startville and they they didn't like me in startville because i came from oxford so <laughs> i was kind of out on an island but so uh, that's what got you interested in nature because you were basically <laughs> by to... yourself out in the middle of the woods somewhere <laughs> yeah i had to run out to knoxby refuge outside of startville and, and find myself if you will because nobody else wanted to hang around me well congratulations by the way yeah thank you it's, yeah. it's an honor it's a real honor good stuff good stuff a uh, big weekend over the weekend do anything um, you know we we kind of we went up to my um um, my parents in Oxford um, and hung out with them over the weekend, uh, saw some family, just went up. And my father-in-law, um, he is a twice-retired football coach and has found his way back into football. So he coaches at <laughs> Corinth, I mean, excuse me, Corinth. And we went up and watched Corinth and Tupelo play and saw some of my wife's family and friends. So, we, you know, we did the Mississippi Friday night football roundup and watched college football all day Saturday and watched both Ole Miss and Mississippi State win. Lord, you had to. Stay about up to past say, if, you, if you saw state win, <laughs> you got more stamina than I do. I, I did. I, I was going to watch them. Um, I, I, I try to hold true to my grandfather's legacy. We're going to watch them at their own. So I stayed up and watched that and then, you know, all the other games in between. So we had just a great weekend. You know, it's incredible. It reminds me of when I was a kid. I grew up in Atlanta, and I would, like, want to listen to the West Coast games for the Braves. Yeah. yeah. And they started at 1035. <laughs> you know, it was that same <laughs> I thing. I mean, the I games know. the game started, and I just looked at my wife, and I said, well, I guess I'll read about it tomorrow. <laughs> Yeah, all my college buddies um, in graduate school were ironically from Iowa, and ne- none of them knew each other before they came to Mississippi State. It was a really? R- it was a r- There's it was like a- 10 people in Iowa. How'd they not know well, each other? Well, I met three of them. Okay. And um, they've well, all almost since— almost quorum. Yeah, I know. They all since uh, scattered back out. One went back to Iowa, but two went to the West Coast, so the Arizona game fit their timeline better than it usually does. So yeah. we all kept in touch, and we were texting it, you know, midnight that, that, that Saturday night and enjoying it. So That's one thing I've discovered about Mississippi. We're a better off, happier place when our football teams are winning. Amen to that. I tell you, I, and not only am I excited about what Leach brings to the table in terms of football, I never thought he'd be a head coach for us, but I love his press conferences. I love oh, him. I him love and, him. Well, him and Kiffin together, I mean, it's like it's, stepbrothers. I mean, you know, it's, movie. it's just an incredible time for football. Yeah. For more than just football. It's entertaining. So it is. Uh, definitely on it that is. as well. Yeah, you touched on Corinth. Uh, quick question. Do they serve slug burgers at the games? Buddy, I have eaten my weight in slug burgers since I married my wife. Yeah, um, I was going to ask you on that. I once did a radio remote up there, yeah. and it's like five hours back here. you know. So they're like, <laughs> hey, would you like all these slug burgers to go? I'm like... There is no place to stop between here and there. I was like, I could hear my stomach making whale songs. I my, said, I think I'll pass. They're delicious. My, my but, wife's grandmother made the best one. I mean, and it was wonderful. Uh, she's since passed, but no, no, I have not had one since that amounts to what she could do. But I love them. 
Yeah, I do. Oh, they're, they're they're delicious. They are. So yeah, I don't want my friends up in Corinth to be mad at me. No, I love Corinth. It's a great town. It's a beautiful town. So much history just and, steeped in history. Yeah. Right on the banks of you know, right outside of Pickwick Lake, right on the Tennessee border. It's a beautiful part of the state. Yeah, really it's is gorgeous. Good stuff. Um, of course. And it's the thing about, the you say, the beautiful part of the state. The nice thing about living in Mississippi is that it is absolutely gorgeous. It is. Um, yeah, we're very fortunate here. We, we all, you know, I'm born and raised here and plan on staying here until they run me out. Um, it's one of the things we take for granted. I mean, our state. Our state is gorgeous. Well, I mean, the biggest pr- thing I think we're probably a threat of is you being plucked out of here by nah, somebody important. No, you know, I'm I'm very happy here, and I don't, you know, uh, although your title of your show is Most Interesting People, I'm, I don't find myself to be that. I just enjoy what I do, and I enjoy Mississippi, and um, it'd be hard to call anywhere else home. It really it would. Yeah, you know, it's really funny because we went up to Maine for summer vacation, you sure. know, because, I mean, we try to take our kids out of the state so they can enjoy it because in a way it makes them enjoy the state more anyway along the coast rocks ocean gorgeous totally different but when you get inland there you're driving along on some of the roads it really made me feel like i was back home it's got a you know that upper east side upper east coast side even in west virginia we my grandfather and i flew up and watched uh, mississippi state play west virginia one time and you feel parts of mississippi in that part of the world and especially in the fall time but in the summertime um you know, I talked to my colleague up there, uh, Kate Dempsey, and, you know, down here when it's 115 degrees, 120 degrees, heat index, and it's 72, you yeah. know, high up there, I always text her, and she's like, well, anytime you want to, just come on up. So, yeah, but the winter's like the shiner. <laughs> that's when she's texting me, yeah. you know, when it's 60 down here in December, and it's, you know, in the negatives, you know, I... I didn't know temperatures could get that low growing up. No, I, I'll leave that to freezers. Man, I, I think Jimmy Buffett had it right on that one when he shot six holes in the freezer. <laughs> so uh, no thank you on that. And I got to tell you, and and you and I, I talked to you when we were walking in on this, you know, and this is what one of the beautiful things about living here is. My son and I are driving to school this morning, yeah. and we live near a, a small lake. It's not huge, maybe 800 acres, which I guess is pretty good size. And we see two bald eagles mm-hmm. out there just circling, catching fish. Yeah. Well, they caught fish, and then they beelined it back up to their huge nest, which I know where that is, too. I told him, I said, you know, you were 13 when you first saw a bald eagle in the wild. I was 53. Exactly. That's amazing. And you see more and more, um, especially around our big bodies of water. You see them on the Oxbow Lakes and the Delta, and you see them on the Core Reservoirs. You see them at Ross Barnett. Uh, you definitely see them on the coast. But they have definitely made a... Um, a 180. They've come back, and it's they're an incredible bird to see and fly. They're huge because they're massive. Yeah, um, and their white tail and their white head. You oh can man. spot them, and you can tell instantly what yeah. they are. Yeah, I yeah. mean, it's just an incredible bird. And even if you're not a bird watcher or enjoy those sights, those birds just the sheer size of them catch your attention. So let me ask you this: When you get a presidential appointment, does it like the um, prize patrol? Do they show up with a giant, you know, check and balloons and confetti, or how does that work? Or do I, you get a phone call? I, and you're like, I "Hey, did, this is the president. I got a job for you." I tell you, um, I did see where the prize patrol is now led by Steve Harvey, and they'll show up, and I'd pay any, I'd oh, pay them to you know show what? up with Steve Harvey. I would too. Ju- I want to just see what suit he's wearing. <laughs> I love that guy. I am Steve Harvey. I, I mean, I, he yeah. is. He's I mean, big, I watch Family Feud just because of him. Every day, six thirty at our house, we're going to watch it yeah. because of him. Oh and, yeah, solid. Uh, so, did Steve Harvey come and tell you? Man, you got it? I couldn't have been that lucky. But no, you, <laughs> you just get a letter in the mail. Oh really? Um, that's the way it came. Secretary Deb Holland from the Interior sent yeah. me a letter, and um, they have a staff person at the Fish and Wildlife Service, Miss Kari Duncan, and and she reached out to me before and congratulated me, and that was an honor too. And to get the letter is an honor, and then. We've yet to have a um, a meeting as a group, but I've been able to engage with various members on the council, and and it's just again I'm honored. It's very oh no kidding. Piece. How did they find How did they find out about you? So the Nature Conservancy, who I work for, has held a seat in that council for quite some time, and then ironically during COVID, uh, the gentleman that held that seat had retired, and then that position became vacant, and. You know, you've got some long tenured groups on there, Ducks Unlimited, Pheasants Forever, and so forth. And the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, had reached out to various groups and said, hey, would you submit some applications of individuals, bi- biographies, and whatnot? And um, my boss, Michael Lifford, uh, out of Virginia, asked me to submit my bio because my background is, is uniquely aligned with the council. I've got a degree in wildlife and forestry, but I've got a master's in wetland ecology. And, yeah. And I've got a sincere interest in, uh, I mean, I grew up duck hunting. 
Yeah. I mean, I grew up duck hunting, um, grew up outside, transitioned into, you know, after high school, worked for Wild Rose Kennels up in Oxford. And you figured out how to make a living doing it. Yeah, I mean, and we, it, it, I, I never had an inside job. Um, I mean, and, and ironically, today is more of the inside job that I've ever had. And then I guided duck hunts at Beaver Dam and Tunica and, and I mean, the amount of the, the way that family treated me, I mean, I consider the Boyds up in Tunica dear friends and more, more, more lined as family than anything. And so with that background and interest and obviously the work at the Nature Conservancy, my boss just said, I think you really would be a, a value added to the team. Mm-hmm. Uh, I knew some of the players already on it. And, you know, we've talked about some key people down here with Ducks Unlimited. And, you know, they're based out of Memphis, so we're in their backyard. And, you know, the rest is history. And we were lucky, lucky enough to be allowed to rejoin and, and get back on and, and take a seat and I look forward to working with them from here forward. So it's going to be, a, lot it be a Zoom thing, or are you going to actually get to be in a room with them? I, you know, I asked that question. I, I'd ask Car. I said, Car, please tell me that when she reached out, I said, tell me we're not doing Zoom. She said, ironically, you'll be a part of the first non Zoom because of COVID. And oh, I nice. said, great. I said, I just, you know, to do this kind of, to do that kind of work. That well, they it's about do, relationships. It's, it is. It's everything. It's, it's, and we got to get back to some of that. We've lost a lot of that because of COVID. And, and as most people will tell you that have met me, I'm a, I'm big about interactions and relationships. Uh, I, I I want to get to know you. I want to know you personally and yeah. professionally, and and see where we can work together. And so it's just my it's just my personality. I'm not a I'm not a Zoom person. I mean, I'm a cartoonist, not an expert on migratory birds. But I think you know, obviously, it's important if you're worried about duck hunting in Mississippi, what's going on up in Iowa or what's going oh, yeah. on different, you know, I mean, and you need to know who to pick up on the phone and have a relationship before you make an ask. That's right. Yeah. Um, and, and I've, we've, we've had those experiences and kudos to Ducks Unlimited and Delta Waterfowl, John Debney, um, was able to sit down with Adam Putnam uh, a few weeks ago and their new president, uh, Chuck and met them in Memphis. I mean, these are people that have a sincere passion about waterfowl yeah. and wetlands and, You've got to know them and interact with them on a personal level. You're not going to get that through a Zoom. Yeah, my, na- my neighbor's with Ducks Unlimited, and I love getting him talking about birds. Oh, I mean, it's, they're an incredible resource. I yeah. mean, that, the work that they do across the um, across the U.S. and then in Canada down in New Mexico is um, you can't you can't deny it. I mean, the impact yeah. that they've had over I think now 75. I think they're 75 years now, but you can't deny the impact of that they've had and the impact they've had on the wetland on the NALCA council that yeah. we're a part of now together. So, so you got two roles uh, and explain both of them. Tell us a little bit about it. Cause I mean, you've got the um, North American wetlands Con- conservation council. So that's one. Yeah. And then you've got the presidential appointed to the neotropical migratory bird conservation act advisory group, which I stumbled upon before. <laughs> you know, you say the word neotropical migrant and, and, and I know it's I, neotropical sounds like something you put on a boo-boo <laughs> on your arm. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, both, both committees, both councils uh, oversee a set amount of funds that are allocated every year from the, from Congress and, you know, with NALCA and, and Neotropical Migratory uh, Conservation Council as well, they oversee a set of funds that people apply from from across the U.S., across yeah. Canada, across Mexico. And there's various grant cycles. And as those applications come in, comes in or those applications come in uh, for the work across the states, uh, the council and then the, every council member has a staff person. And, you know, they're just going through the projects and vetting the projects. Mm. You know, which one's got the greatest impact? Where can we get the biggest bang for our buck? What's having, does this fit our long-term priorities? You know, does this one fall within this one? Could these two, you know, could these two work together? Could this leverage work we did 10 years ago? You know, there's various amounts of um, kind of filters you look through. Staff makes recommendations up. Council votes on them. And then, you know, we vote to get a certain amount of them funded. And, you know, I think since it, since its enactment in 1989, the NALCA Council and Neotropical Migratory Bird Council, I think they've granted out over $2 billion. Wow. And they've had another $4 billion matched. So that's $6 billion across 32, 30, 3,300 projects across the U.S., Canada, and Mexico. And, I mean, those are having – I mean, that's real money. You know, that's no, real money. Yeah. And a lot of things out there that they've impacted probably wouldn't have been enhanced or maybe not be in existence today had NALCA not stepped in and made some investments. You talk about projects. What kind of projects? What are some of the things that are done to help, sure. obviously? And, and I, you know, I can think, well, buying land or doing that. But, sure. but I know there's probably a wider, 
uh, range of projects. Well, I mean, you hit on one, buying land's one, and they can make a, uh, make acquisitions in terms of easements and whatnot, but they can also make fee title acquisitions, you know, to adjacent lands at National Wildlife Refuges mm -hmm. or the wildlife management areas to make those publicly accessible, um, so to increase recreational opportunities. But also, also they do, you know, a lot of their work goes to enhance wetland habitats, yeah. either on public or private lands. You know, there's some structures that can, there's some programs that can go on on private lands that actually aid in habitat enhancement that, you know, those waterfowl, they're migratory. And they've got to have habitat too, and not all that habitat's going to be found on public lands. There's not enough of it to yeah. to meet the demand, so you have to have a private lands uh, lens. So it can go on private lands, it can go on public lands, it can be wetland enhancement, it can be fee title acquisition, it can be restoration, it can be a number of things. But it's all got to be focused on wetland enhancement and habitat protection at the end of the day. How are we doing in Mississippi on that? You know, I think we've. I look at it from the lower river standpoint. Yeah. Uh, so. I look at us in, in alignment with Louisiana and Arkansas because they're our closest two neighbors that are enacting similar work. And back in the 80s during the Farm Bill, we enacted a, a program, and, and I mean we as in the U.S., uh, called the Wetland Reserve Program. And since then, we've enrolled in that program about 750,000 acres across those three states. NALCA's played a role in some of that in terms of enhancement and whatnot. But no, I mean, I think we're doing a, a really good job. I think we have a passion for making sure we take care of that habitat probably more so than you see across the U.S. I think, you know, it's just in our culture. It's in yeah. our it's in our DNA, you know, just like your buddies that are your neighbors at Ducks Unlimited. I mean, I promise you they grew up doing what I grew up doing, yeah. and it's just— Well, as I say, we have, a, we have a real and very genuine hunting culture here in Mississippi, it, it, and, and you can't—if you don't have anything to hunt— That's right. That's know, right. At the end of the day. I mean, it, it's just—again, it's a—I tell people all the time about Mississippi, our sense of place— it's probably stronger than anywhere I've ever been. Yeah. And and you interact with people um, across the U.S. And I've yet to found, find any culture that understands or appreciates the sense of place that we have here. And we're really so blessed that. to have it, too. Amen. Like I said, even Amen. if you live in the city, you can drive five miles and you're not in the city anymore. No. That's I mean, the beauty it, of it. It is. And you're only, you know, you're only an hour west of the Mississippi River, you know, third largest river in the world. Yeah. Um, you got the Big Black here. You got the Pearl, Lower Pearl. You got the Upper Pearl. You got the Ross Barnett. You got the Gulf Coast. I, mean, I can go on and on about the resources you got at your fingertips. We still got about you know forty minutes, so <laughs> we're we're not in a big rush. But I tell you what, talk a little bit about the Nature Conservancy in Mississippi. And by the way, folks, if you're not listening to what we're talking about in between, we covered what's in a slug burger because we'd mentioned that before. Yeah. We talked about the blues a little bit and all the famous people that are from Mississippi. So we, you know, we ought to basically package that and just send it out on well, online. We could, we could have a whole conversation just on the blues and the music. I mean, Mississippi, we're getting off topic here, but hey. I, I do a, I do a presentation at TNC and, and I rope in our conservation work, but then I, you know, if we're close to where Muddy Waters was, you know, if there's a key blues marker next to the project, I, yeah. I rope in all that. But Mississippi built American music as we know it, and yeah. and as of late, there's a there's a great um, great show on Netflix called Rumble. If you've not seen it yet, and Charlie Patton, um, who was the Godfather yeah. of the blues, uh, he they've pretty much Howlin' Wolf called. Uh, there was a quote Howlin' Wolf made said he was the baddest guy he ever met in terms of being a musician. I mean, and he was an American Indian, and so there's an American Indian connection there too, which has become quite unique. But you know, we built, I mean, Mississippi built American music, I mean, as yeah. we know it. I mean, there's no denying the roots where they're at. And Which I think is really cool incredible. that you can tie that into. What yeah, you're doing. I, yeah. I, I love doing it because to me, conservation can get kind of boring if you're not bro if you're not roping in the culture. You know, the slug burgers, the blues, you know, just stuff that we take for granted. People are enamored by that because of the history of it down here and, and just how it all just took off. And, you know, Elvis Presley and, you know, when when they invited, you know, the Beatles and Rolling Stones, I mean, those guys were, the, the Howlin' Wolf and Muddy Waters were famous to them. I mean, they yeah. they, they sought them out to bring them overseas. Oh, and they, and they grabbed B.B. King and took him out on I, tour with them. I mean, B.B. takes it to a whole nother level. Well, yeah. <laughs> you know, I he, mean, it's funny because we were talking about, I was talking about uh, 
Charles the Third or you yeah. know whatever in English, yeah. all that going on over there. And I said, oh, Mississippi, we you know we've got already got the king and it's yeah. Elvis. And then a lot of people know what well, you forgot BB too. That's I was right. like, God, how That's many right. kings do we have? We, yeah. we have a whole court. And, I, and you know the recent announcement of the R and B Museum going to Marks, and we got the Grammy Museum in Cleveland, and yeah. obviously BB's in any We can yeah, have so, a whole yeah, conversation. Just yeah, about we'll get you back on the show and do that as well. <laughs> Your role as a state director of the uh, conservancy, what has that been? I mean, what, 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 how, what do you do on a daily basis? Well, I'll tell you a little bit about the Nature Conservancy. We've been in Mississippi uh, since about 1976. Uh, the first work that we did, we bought about 35,000 acres on the Pascagoula River. Wow. Um, bought it from the Pascagoula. Which is the only or the last wild river in Mississippi, well, it's, right? It's the, it's the largest undammed river yeah. in the lower 48. Okay. A lot of people don't know In the whole country. In yeah. the whole country. Yeah, lower, except con- for Alaska and Hawaii. Con- yeah. yeah, continental U.S., largest undammed uh, river. Supports a growing industry between Ingalls, Chevron, and Southern Company down on the coast. I mean, it's a remarkable, remarkable story. Well, we started in 76, made that purchase, which has now grown into 80,000 acres protected on the on the Pascagoula, and it's just a gem of a natural resource. That sounds like an amazing kayaking canoe trip. You ought to do it. Uh, yeah. There's actually a gentleman that's doing that now, and his name, his title, I mean, his company name slips me, but he's actually doing kayak tours, and some of the properties that we still own on the river have some sandbars, and he's tinted up on them and whatnot. So there is, it's an incredible kayak trip. Yeah incredible river to do it. But since 76, we've worked and conserved about 200,000 acres across the state. Um, we've initiated, a lot of people don't know this, uh, if, you're a, if you're a hunter or a fisherman out there and you're doing it on public lands, we've, we've helped create through acquisitions uh, about six national wildlife refuges and now six wildlife management areas. The most recent one was the Phil Bryant WMA over in, over in South Delta. But, you know, our day-to-day is we're really looking in how we can leverage our state resources to bring down federal money and put it right on the ground that enhances our wildlife habitat. Yeah. How do you decide? I mean, do you see an area that is under stress or that, you you know, thinking like, for instance, you want to make sure that the Pascagoula stays wild, for sure. instance? Yeah. Sure. No, I mean, we do. We have we, we have a mountain of science that goes into the, into the, the body of work that the amount of science that goes into our body of work that drives where our decisions or where to place gotcha. money. So we, we use the science and we're science driven, but we are a land based group. I mean, we own or have easements on about 6 million acres across the U S Wow. You know, one of the largest landowners in the U S and to me, that's probably our most powerful piece because we have, we have skin in the game. Yeah. So if you as a landowner have questions, we can talk about our, our experiences in terms of how we've managed and, place concert you know sustainable conservation practices on our timber we harvest timber we do it in, in you know in synergy with how we can enhance wildlife habitat on our property but we still understand there's an economic piece that goes into that from a landowner's perspective so when you talk with us and you hear from us we're coming at it from a landowner being a landowner. so your resources well i mean we are yeah. i mean we're we're managing you know bison and cattle out in oklahoma we're growing corn in in uh, northern california we're taught, you know, we're, we've got crawfish um, leases in our properties in Louisiana, and you know the list goes on. I mean, so what's your specialty in Mississippi? Our specialty here is really land-based conservation yeah. in a way that, uh, you know, that just that speaks to Mississippi's greatest natural resources. Um, we've done some timber management. We we can speak to that. We've, you know, carbon has become a big a big uh, topic as of late, and we're doing some carbon work and. You know, it's just day to day. We're out there. Um, we're speaking from our shared experiences as a landowner, and we're again, we're trying to leverage every, every bit of money that we can to get it down here to Mississippi. Yeah, we've seen some of the effects of climate change across the country. Obviously, what's going on in the West is horrific. You know, with the drought and and what's going on with the heat wave. We we had an abnormally wet year this year, which you know I don't complain about because it's not 115 degrees. Sure, but, but sure. you know, next year we might have a drought. So I mean, y'all are having to take that in consideration. Yeah, we. Too. we we definitely look at uh, weather pattern models, and and if you look at models looking out, some of that we've already seen. Um, they call for increased rain, increase intensity in rainfall events. You know, growing up, a three inch rain was a big rain. Yeah, we can get a three inch rain in thirty minutes now. Yeah, you know, it's very and, tropical, and it yeah. may and it may yeah. be quick. It may be, you know, it may be quick, and we may not have another rain for a few months. And so you're seeing some of those models play out today, and a lot of that science is built into where our priorities are. Are, are going and we look at um, we look at 
flows, uh, wildlife flows. A lot of people don't understand. You know, you got to look at uh, the recent report about a year ago. It was during COVID. They showed that terrestrial animals are moving one mile north. And I forget the timeline, but it was a very short timeline. Yeah. And they're showing it, you know, it's progression north. And it's just it's just in response. And behind them comes another set of wildlife species. So if you're, if you're habitat-oriented like we are, we're kind of skating to where the puck's going right. in some of our work or a vast majority so of our work. So in central Mississippi, you might end up with what you would have in south Mississippi. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And, and, you know, I, we're on the back end of alligator season. And... And you think about places. I remember growing up in North Mississippi, and you know, an alligator was something you saw in the swamps of Louisiana, yeah, or the mangroves in Florida. You know, not Sardis Lake in Oxford, Mississippi, and that's not the case today. And a lot of that's due in part to the. Um, well, but say they're they're not endangered. That's right. Yeah. And, and a lot of that's due in part to the success that the wildlife department has done in managing that managing that resource and you see it play out during our hunting seasons that were just that just ended and you see people but you're seeing you're seeing harvest of those animals in just Yeah, parts the Tennessee of the River. There was one up there and I was like, "What?" I know. Yeah. I know. And then they show up in strange places, you know, where the Bonnet Carry was open a few years ago back when um, for, the unfortunate severely unfortunate situation was going on in the backwater area of the Delta. Yeah. Um one of those so much fresh water was coming out of Bonnet Carry, you know, they showed up on our beaches on the Gulf Coast. Yeah. <laughs> <I know. laughs> so, you know, again, but you are seeing movements, yeah. and you're seeing movements every day, and that's just you know patterns are changing, and that's just what it is. That's what weather does. Yeah. So we're just pro- we're trying to you know skate where the puck is and, and do it in response to what we're seeing. Speaking of movements and changes, uh, you've been <laughs> with the Nature Conservancy for eleven years. Mm-hmm. Do you ever think, wow, eleven years? And what did you start out as? And kind of talk a little bit about your progress sure. as you went through the worked your way up the ranks. Yeah. So back to Mississippi State, and at this time they had proudly accepted me as one of theirs and I was no longer the kid from Oxford and I was in graduate school wrapping up graduate school um, had a professor there a gentleman by the name of Robbie Kroger and Robbie came in and said hey there's a job opening I think you ought to look at in Nature Conservancy and I had to be honest with him I said Robbie I have no idea who the who the Nature Conservancy is I've grown up outdoors all my life that's not I, a great interview question no, answer it, for an interview well, yeah. I, ironically what he told me was well whatever you do don't say that in your interview <laughs> So I interviewed for what was then the freshwater program manager and um, and ended up successfully getting the job. And they hired me, and they were gracious enough to hire this kid. Green as that door right there, straight out of college. And worked for the, worked doing that for about two years, and then took over the role as associate state director, which was a which was a, a very different leap from what I was doing day to day. A lot of my work was based in the Delta, and I was yeah. working with the great groups over there: Delta Farm, Delta Wildlife, and Delta Councils. We were having a lot of fun and doing a lot of great work. And then associate state director for a few years, and been state director since. And you know, day to day is every day is different. Yeah, I mean, every day is different. But would you have it any different? Seriously? No, sir. Yeah. Um, I cannot do a monotonous job. I cannot do that. That's why. I, that's why I love being outside. Every day is different. How many miles do you think you drive a year? Well, before COVID, it was quite a quite a bit. Yeah. Um, the irony of it is, you're probably safer from COVID out and about in the no state. Doubt. You, yeah. No doubt. I remember. I mean, it's a Queen of County. I think had one case in the whole two years. You so, know? so you laugh. You laugh about that. But I was in Isaquina County when our group. It was. Um, it was in March. COVID hits. Everybody remembers this. And I get the call from our regional director at the time, and Jan Glendening, and I said, and she said, "Hey, we're shutting down, you know, shutting offices down." Yeah. And I was thinking, I'm sitting there on what is now Phil Bryant WMA, and I'm thinking, Lord, I'm I'm safer here. I'm not, I'm you know, I'm ten miles from the nearest human. I'm safer here. That's what I told her, and you know, and she said, "Well, this, you know, let's just pray this doesn't last." And little did we know what we were getting into, but. You know, in response to COVID, we found that everybody felt that way. You know, people ran outdoors during yeah. COVID. And the pressure that was placed on our national park system, our national refuge system, just from visitors, if we're going to have a problem, we'll take that problem. And so I think people kind of refound the outdoors during COVID. Um, and it's been that way since. And we've continued to be that way since. I mean, also, too, I mean, just... You know, with population increases, and like I said, I, I'm right. a big fran- fan of the Smokies. I've been yeah, since man, a little kid, yeah. you know. Yeah. But I mean, Blue that part Ridge up in North Carolina, it's like the bears are like, man, there's like there's a population of people that are I know. exploding. I know, and, can't and, trust them. <laughs> and and, it, and you know, some of our greatest acquisitions happened during COVID. We did a huge Cumberland's deal, a 
across West Virginia, Tennessee, Kentucky, um, to kind of fill in parts of that part of the world, just beautiful, just landscapes, yep. mountainous landscapes. And then obviously we were wrapping up our stuff over in the South Delta, um, our purchase from what was formerly known as Anderson Tully. And I think that's been a very, very successful, uh, public recreational due in part to what the department wildlife department's done. Mm -hmm. And they've enacted something over there in terms of, uh, how you can hunt that place. It's quite unique. Um, you know, when you get a permit and you, are successful and get an application to hunt phil bryant wma you get a couple hundred acres to you and your party of five for a set amount of days wow and that i mean you can go yeah. in there and have a camping experience you can take your kids in there without the rush of having to run out and be out of there in 24 hours you know you get a set amount of days and kudos to the wildlife commission for doing that and the, and the department for really approaching that because i think during covid they found that people desired it desperately yeah just to get out Definitely. Uh, it's a mental health thing as yeah, much as absolutely. anything. Definitely, <laughs> definitely a mental health thing. Man, but also, it too, it allows everybody in Mississippi to have the same opportunity at well, well, our resources. That, and it gives people a glimpse into the Mississippi River bottoms in a way yeah. that just aren't, you know, there's not many opportunities to really see what those river bottoms are about and how how diverse they are from a biodiversity standpoint, but this the sheer amount of wildlife that, Take that use that place as a home. I mean, it's incredible, Definitely. absolutely incredible. So, the importance and the impact on the state nature conservancy on the state's conservation efforts. How would you sum that up? You know, we try to we approach everything that we have from partnerships. Um, we can't do it all by ourselves, and so that's where our relationships with Ducks Unlimited, Wildlife Mississippi, Delta Waterfowl, the Foundation for Wildlife Fishery and Parks. I mean, it is a joint effort. You saw that in this past session when we got behind and very strongly supported the passage of the Mississippi Outdoor Stewardship Trust Act. Now, that's Mississippi's first dedicated source for conservation funding. We did not have that. We were only one of two states in the southeast that didn't, and we were losing out on federal money because we didn't have it yeah. because we had no way to match federal money, so we were losing out. And kudos to the legislature and the leadership down there and the governor and lieutenant governor, speaker of the house, secretary of the state, the list goes on, you know, Bill Kincaid, Neil Whaley, uh, Trey Lamar. These, these folks got behind it because it was the right thing to do. It was good for Mississippi, but that's important because it one showcased the value of sound policy, what mm -hmm. policy can do and the levers that policy can pull in support of you know, Mississippi outdoors. But it also, also showcased the strength of, conservation partnerships because yeah. you know what i was saying was the same thing that you was saying was the same thing that wildlife mississippi was saying was the same mm -hmm. thing the foundation wildlife fishery and parks because we all knew the importance of it and that's a monumental deal um that's a that's a that's a massive accomplishment the state of mississippi had just just achieved in the past six months and it's gonna it's gonna take the conservation efforts here it's going to put them on steroids now, in my opinion, um, awesome. because because some people you'll have some resources now that can be leveraged, and and we'll see it. So one wildlife area that you go to a lot is the capital. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all agree. Sometimes you know it's just yeah. I tell you, one of the fun things. I love. By the way, I, just to say, I absolutely love going to the capital. It's one of my favorite things, especially during session. I, I was just, just about amazing. to say, um, what's incredible about being down at the capital is you get to see every part of Mississippi represented. Yeah. And you get to see all the interests come together. And, you know, different parts of the state have different interests. But when you see them collide in the Capitol, it, it, it's it's fun to be there. Yeah. It's incredible to be there. And it was incredible to see them support something that we brought forward or helped yeah. bring no, forward. No, I mean, kudos to them because there was a lot of money being left on the table. It, it is. Yeah. And, and to you know, an example, Georgia in their first year, I'm gonna get these wrong. I used to know them off the top of my head, but they took twenty million and turned it into nine. You know, turned it into a hundred. Wow! In the first year, just from leveraging. Yeah. And so when you see that, the legislature they didn't even blink. I mean, they were like, "Yeah, this is we can do that. We can we can do this too." Good and on them. They've got yeah. a good board. Uh, they've lieutenant governor and the governor have just recently appointed uh, the board members to the trust. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of sincere interest to, to see this go the long, you know, the long term. That's, that's great. That's great. Like I said, you grew up in Oxford and I, then you ended up going to Mississippi state. That happens. I understand. I loved it. Yeah. I loved that, it. That's a great, love both places. Makes egg bowl fascinating. Ooh, I'm sure. It, buddy. I, I'm sure a lot of fun. So <laughs> officially going back home. And, and I so married forth. a rebel. 
Did it, you really? Oh, yes, sir. Oh, good. I just good. went ahead and just made it, just stirred that pot real well. I understand. I I went to Tennessee and married a girl that went to Georgia. Oh, yeah. And, um, she was fine until last year, the whole national championship. <laughs> She's just been insufferable. Oh, goodness That's gracious. what happens. I know it. I mean, her Kirby Smart tattoo has got to go. No, just kidding. She did not do that. By the way, she actually taught your kid, too. Yeah, so I like uh, that. yeah Hudson was so jealous this morning when I left. I, yeah. I told him. I shouldn't have shared it with him because – he was a little little miffed at me when I dropped him off for school. So, oh, she does not have, by the way, have a Kirby Smart tattoo. That was a joke, and she would kill me for making it. But I will say this: she is the true celebrity in our family. So I will say. Well, that. I tell you yeah. what, she does a good job. Those kids love her. Yeah, I mean, no. she really does a great job. Oh, I can see why. I mean, I fell for her too once too. So I, still, I get it. Still do every day. I get it. Okay, so anyway, and I love this story. This was um, you. You love the outdoors as mm-hmm. a kid. Your dad would run off hunting all the time. Oh yeah, but you never got to go. Until one day you decided, maybe I'm going to make myself go. Yeah, I would wake up. My dad and a group of his friends every weekend, um, you know, every Saturday morning would take off. And I could wake up and I could hear him kind of rumbling. And then you'd smell the coffee, Folgers Crystals coffee coming through the house. And yeah. so that kind of indicated where things were, you know, in terms of his Yeah, schedule. for those that don't know what that is, that was before Currents, <laughs> you know. That was like how to make coffee without making That's coffee. Right. That's right. And you'd smell that, and it'd, it'd wake you up. And the way our beds, our bedrooms were all set up, I kind of had a, a line of sight to the hallway so I could see him coming and going. And then that smell would kind of leave because he, he was leaving. And uh, I'd hear that Jeep crank up, and they'd go, and sometimes they'd return early, and sometimes they'd return later. It just, But I was always enthralled with the stories that came back, and the you know, dog got to go with them. We had a chocolate lab at the time, and I just— one day I said, heck with this. If I'm the dog t- can go, I can go. If if, if I, can, I can make a way, there's a way somewhere here. And I tell everybody, I just frankly got tired of getting left at the house and snuck into the Jeep. And uh, true story, scared him about 30 miles down the road on Highway 6 headed to Batesville. And the rest is history. I mean, I got to go ever since. And cold, it didn't matter. I have, I have frozen my tail off and I have I have got a better workout dragging decoys across a, a mud flat in the Mississippi Delta and um it really I tell them all the time I said you, you didn't realize it at the time but you you created a monster you know it's just there was no way that I was not going to do what I'm doing today after that I mean I was I I can paint you I'm not as definitely not as great a drawer as you but I can paint that image in my head of how that morning went down today and got to go ever since he's my best friend to this day my dad is I bet he's proud and uh, well, I, sometimes he is, sometimes he's not. Well, he's your dad. I mean, that's that's how we roll. I mean, you you know right. that you're I'm dad. One, now. You, you know how that goes. Yeah, um, but he he sincerely is my best friend. There's nobody else that uh, compares to him in terms of obviously being my dad, but also as um, being in the duck line with him. You still hunt with him every time I get a chance. That's awesome. uh, we hunt every opening day together. Uh, my uncles join us. My uncles a big played a big part of part of my life. Taught me how to swing a baseball bat and got into got a lot of trouble that way too. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, you're supposed to hit a ball. Not yeah. a, not 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 everybody around you. Well, it was the baseball teams I played on there after that got me into the trouble okay. that he created there. Gotcha. Um, wouldn't trade those memories. But uh, no, Dad and I hunt together as much as we can and. He taught me how to blow a duck call and um, everything I've learned as far as the outdoors, either getting, you know, getting roped up a tree, you know, into the deer stand or, you know, getting drug in a canoe or a little flat bottom to a, you know, set of cypress trees on Sardis Lake to go goose hunting or sitting in a duck blind on a on a tree line in Tallahatchie County. And, you know, it was it shaped my life. I mean, literally shaped my life. You went to Lafayette County High School. Well, we call it Lafayette. I so said we, Lafayette. Did we, I say Lafayette County? Yeah. Didn't I? So we, okay, we, yeah, we, I, we, I just moved here. I've been here 25 <laughs> years and just said that. Lord. Well, well no, don't. That's the second mistake I've made today, so I just let you know Don't, that, don't so. laugh. We, we, like, to Lafayette, short, yeah, we yeah. like to shorten things up as Lafayette. much as we can, Lafayette County. Well, we don't need real, all those No, syllables. what's really bad is that literally my nephew's wife teaches there, and so I'm going to catch ahead. Greek. No, it's Go just, ahead. No, it's she teaches Latin. She's new. She's but she, you didn't have her. But the problem is, what's going to happen is it's going to get to her. Yeah. And I'm going to be heckled yeah. for the rest of my life. So. Well, what's funny is you know I spent a Ugh. fair amount of time, spent a lot of time in Louisiana. You can hear me blushing on the radio right now. <laughs> and I, uh, you know, my time in Louisiana, and it's funny. Um, met a lot of people from Lafayette, Louisiana, and they yeah. are aware of how we say Lafayette, it in Mississippi. Yeah. And they're Which like, is the right way. Yeah. I mean, and, forget uh, the whole French thing. Well, you know, minor details, you know, minor details. But, but yeah. you did, and you had a teacher named Pam Sanders. Pam Samuels. Pam, okay. Pam I, Samuels, that's okay. right. Okay. Yeah, Pam Pretty Samuels. Close. She was my sixth grade 
uh, teacher. Um, ironically, her daughter and her daughter's uh, husband live in my neighborhood now in, in Madison. We cross paths. Oh, you're day. kidding me. Yeah. yeah. But it's Pam, Mississippi, two degrees I of know, separation. You know, it's not a state. It's a club. Mm-hmm. Don't forget that. But Pam retired from um, Lafette, and I saw her one day at a at a uh, career fair at, Miss, at, at Lafette High School, and she was working for the Corps of Engineers, and she said, hey, when you're ready, you ought to, you ought to you ought to think about this uh, internship opportunities through the Corps. And so when the time came, I reached back out to her, and um, this will tell you how funny this is, talking about small town. Uh, the lady that was over that particular program, my mom uh, has a salon in Oxford, and she was one of my mom's clients, Lisa Gathright. And so Lisa got my name, and uh, I interviewed, and I interviewed with a, a bunch of other kids, and four of us were selected and that scholarship opportunity in turn essentially paid for my schooling at Mississippi State for four years and get granted me a mountain of experience with Barry Moss and Rob Patterson and Dan Kirkland, the, the foresters and, and wildlife biologists at Sardis and Enid Arkabutla in Grenada. The rest was history. I mean, it was an incredible experience. And um, all because Pam Samuels and I crossed paths at a career fair. And she, I mean, it just, again, we talked about relationships matter. Yeah. Um, I could write a book on just little stuff like that, just in terms of how little things, relationships go a long way. And that's one of them. Uh, When you write that book, I'll I'll be one of the first ones to draw a copy. I'll illustrate it for you. Yeah, Yeah. illustrate it for you. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, just don't make me pronounce anything because I'll screw (laughs) that up. Um, But, you know, you talk about the core. And, of course, that was a great experience for you because you got to, number one, I don't, some people may not know how much the core influences what goes on in Mississippi. They just do a lot of work here. It's just incredible. And, of course, they're right there in Vicksburg, Mm -hmm. you know, obviously. You know, the largest concentrations of engineers are in Vicksburg, Mississippi, because of the core. And and what I got to do day-to-day on management, um, habitat management, wildlife management, um, just learning sound timber management from Rob Patterson and Dan Kirkland, being involved in timber sales, being involved with the loggers, um, being involved with control burns, which, you know, have become a a buzzword now because of the stuff out West. And, you know, we were doing that 20 years ago and, you know, just those items just really to do it in tandem while going to school made school so much more important because I I was, because you could saw, you could see what everything was leading. That's right. You, You know, the application of what my professors were teaching us, and to mimic, you know, to say, oh, we did that last semester at Sardis Lake, or we were doing some of these techniques, and just, I don't know, it just made that much that experience so much better. And that's why I'm a big proponent of you need some professional experience before you get out of school because you just become a stronger candidate, you become a a stronger biologist, a stronger forester um, when you do it that way instead of coming out completely green. So when the opportunity presents itself, you ought to jump on it. And I'm, I always encourage folks to do it, and we try to support that at the conservancy too through scholarships yeah, and internship opportunities. Yeah, do you, you you go into the schools and, and talk to them and get them interested? In, yeah. Because you're, you're creating another generation. Well, not only that, we try to we try to bring those, we, we try to provide intern opportunities because we want to put our money where our mouth is. And I recently had a donor that came to me and said that um, she wanted to really support educational opportunities. And I said, well, I, I can tell you exactly how it impacted me. And if you're okay with it, I've got an idea. Mm-hmm. And so she's going to support um, support some on the ground uh, semester based uh, uh, conservation. I mean, excuse me, um, scholarship opportunities, and and she's a proud proponent of the Mississippi State. So they know I'm coming to talk to them about it, and we're excited. I mean, that's the type of work that matters to the students because that next generation of of me and Ed Pennies and uh, Scott Lemons and Jerry Holdens and Adam Putnam's and um, John Debney's, they're all, they're all in the school system right now, you know, and they're, and they're coming. So you got to hit them where they're at. I mean, you're a little bit, you're younger than me. You're obviously way more advanced in your career. You're doing great. (laughs) I don't know about that, but I'm just saying you had mentors Mm -hmm. and now we're getting at the point in our age where we have to turn around and pay back what we've been given. Yeah. And I think back to the people, uh, one of the guys that meant the most to me growing up, excuse me, at the core, when I was coming through the core was a guy named Jackie Fox. Yeah. And Jackie Fox was worked for USDA and he did a lot of our wildlife trapping, but the way he treated me as an individual, um, really made a difference to me because I was, he treated me like an equal yeah. and, 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 but he, he treated me that way and expected, you know, that to be the same. And, and I, I, anytime I get the chance and I hadn't seen him in quite some time, 
but he was one of the relationships that mattered the most and had the largest impact on me just because of how he treated me. Yeah. And I learned more. I learned more that way through him and learned better through him that way. And I'm not doing a lot of wildlife trapping these days, but people management, you know, just in terms of, you know, being a good colleague, being a good uh, supervisor, whatnot. A lot of it I learned from Jackie, and he probably didn't even realize what he was teaching me at the time. If you want to get back into that, I saw a new tree this morning. If you see one, you know there's about 5,000 more. <laughs> I tell you, those nasty things. They are, Lord. man. I mean, it's like there's nothing redeeming about them whatsoever. No, there's no redeemable features. You know, it's kind of like the weavers in, um, um, oh, shoot, William Faulkner's books. You know, yeah. There's no redeemable features in those individuals. So Nutria, Nutria definitely falls right in line. I can't remember. Was it? I don't know if I remember. It was Gustav or which hurricane it was that blew through there that washed them all up on the coast. It was definitely I, – I think it was Gustav. Yeah. Oh my gosh, those things plump when you cook them. I mean, they literally lay on the bait. It was. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Louisiana had a five dollar a tail bounty for. I, they may still have it. I mean, it was. Um, but the interesting thing about them, they're. I could have made five bucks this morning. Uh, you could have. You could have. Man, I whacked them right in the I head. I know. They make a great coat though. Their pelt's pretty incredible. Really? Yes, they make a great coat. Hey, I'm thinking about a business venture if you're interested. Well, buddy, it's All out right. there. All right, so talk a little bit more so folks can get more information about the Nature Conservancy here in Mississippi and obviously your website and so forth. Sure. You know, a lot of our work is driven by private donations. I mean, we are a membership and private donation-oriented group, and, you know, that's what makes really our gas in our in our car, gas in our truck. Um, you can go to nature.org backslash Mississippi. We have a donate page. You can get up to date on all our work there. Um, got a just top-notch uh, media marketing team that, makes that available to you you can kind of get one-on-one with our with our program managers too but you can see all the body of work and we hope you support us and that's what makes our work possible that's great that's great well it's been fun today i've enjoyed Thanks, this Marshall. so appreciate i appreciate you. that um ah, just just want we'll to do this again sometime we'll talk about blues and about food and slug burgers well we'll have to get uh, you know, we talked about john edge uh, yeah john T. edge we ought to get him and wright thompson in here with us and that could be an interesting conversation. We could definitely, just in definitely tell some stories there. Um, I tell you what, I don't have the closing on my my sheet. So anyway, hey, look, this is a production of MPB Think Radio. I want to thank everybody for listening today. I just looked down, I was like, you know, where's my closing? Wait, I've done that for five years. I should know it. But anyway, it's a production of MPB Think Radio, and it's produced by the incredibly talented Jermaine Flood. I want to thank Alex Littlejohn for being with us. Hey, look, we're going to do this again next week. Y'all have a great week, and thank you for listening. Thanks for listening to this MPB Think Radio podcast. MPB depends on support from listeners, So if you can, please contribute today at MPB on.